Well, thank you, Rick, and thanks to the ISBA and Dan and the CBA for hosting this event. I think I've been to 14 of these. It's an honor to be here. Uh, Maggie, were you listening to that introduction at all? I just... <laughs> uh, now, no, now, normally I would uh, begin my remarks with a lighthearted story that introduces the theme of my talk. The story would probably involve my time with the Chicago Bears, and it would almost certainly be self-deprecating. That's the standard approach I use when I speak, and people seem to enjoy it, and no doubt many of you have heard just such a speech from me, maybe even at this very event. Uh, but not tonight. Tonight I am not going to be lighthearted, or funny, or self-deprecating. I'm not gonna tell jokes and I'm not gonna pause for laughs. Because tonight, I wanna talk about something that is deeply serious, something that impacts not only our profession but also our nation, and something that calls for a response. A response not so much in words or in action, but rather in attitude, in posture, in perspective. As we gather tonight, our nation is suffering a crisis of trust. No one can deny this. And unlike previous seasons of uncertainty, this one seems to penetrate every sphere of life. Politically, the country is split right down the middle on a whole host of issues, with both sides convinced that they are right, and neither side looking for or even inviting compromise. This is true of immigration reform, our response to ISIS, the health care law, same-sex marriage, abortion. On each of these issues, and on many, many more, the country is deeply divided, with no room to meet in the middle. But not only at that, on each of these issues, both sides are convinced that they are on the losing side, so that the resulting dynamic is not one of winners and losers, but one in which everyone feels like his or her values, his or her issues are being marginalized. The last time that more than 50% of Americans believed the country was heading in the right direction was June of 2009. Both globally and domestically, the Ebola crisis has many Americans wondering whether we are adequately prepared for an epidemic outbreak, be it halfway across the world in Liberia or just three states away in Dallas, and, whether, and wondering whether the existing protocols are sufficiently safe and sufficiently rehearsed to ensure that any unexpected outbreaks are contained and controlled rather than multiplied and spread. Financially, we face a crisis of confidence in the future, most especially with respect to retirement, whether it's Social Security, Medicare, 401ks, or pensions. Many of us are wondering whether the system that's in place is sustainable and whether the retirement we planned and expected for will be there in the time when the time comes. Institutionally, Poll after poll confirms that we as Americans have very little confidence in our leaders. Congress's disapproval rating has hovered steadily above 70% for the last three years, and President Obama's disapproval rating is now consistently above 50%. But even more telling is this. Historically, Americans have tended to hold Congress as an institution in very low esteem while holding their own local representative in very high esteem. In other words, the problem isn't my congressman, it's everyone else's congressman. Not anymore. Earlier this year, an ABC News poll confirmed that for the first time in the 25-year history of that poll, more than half the country disapproves not only of, of Congress as an institution, but also of their own local representative. This has never happened before, and it is deeply illustrative of the crisis of trust we are facing. 
and then there is Ferguson. And Ferguson is unique among all the situations I've described because at the heart of Ferguson is the system that you and I serve. When trust breaks down in Washington or on Wall Street, that's important and that's unfortunate. But there's not a whole lot you and I can do directly in response. We can't restore trust and move things forward because we are not in Washington and we are not on Wall Street. But we do serve the legal system. And that system is at the heart of the Ferguson crisis and there is no question that for many in our country, trust in the legal system and the system you and I serve has broken down. Look at what we've been seeing. Protesters taken to the streets by the thousand with slogans like, hands up, don't shoot, black lives matter, and the system didn't fail, it worked. That's the problem. Students at our elite law schools, including Harvard, Berkeley, and Penn, staging walkouts and die-ins to protest the grand jury's refusal to indict. Calls for systemic criminal justice reforms from voices as diverse as President Obama and Senator Rand Paul. Yes, Ferguson was the catalyst for the current wave of response. What, what's clear is that Ferguson did not cause the underlying mistrust and resentment. On the contrary, the events of the past months and even more of the past weeks are born of a deep division, a deep mistrust that exists in our country. And though that division is now boiling over, the reality is that it's always simmering just beneath the surface, just waiting for a Michael Brown, a Trayvon Martin, and Eric Garner to release it. We will never know what exactly transpired on that tragic night in Ferguson. There is no video footage, and the eyewitness accounts tell a variety of stories. But even if we know, never know exactly what happened that night, the events that have followed teach us a great deal about what is going on in our country right now. They teach us that racial division and racial mistrust is still very much a part of the American landscape. They teach us that in many parts of America, trust is broken down completely between the community and the police, and that for many, the appearance of law enforcement provokes not comfort or security, but rather suspicion and fear. They teach us that to many in our community, the criminal justice system appears rigged, existing not to ascertain truth or dispense justice, but instead to punish the weak and protect the powerful. But most of all, they teach us once again that in so many areas of life, race, crime, poverty, class, justice, there seems to exist two very different Americas, defined by two very different perspectives, and populated by people who do not understand and do not trust either each other or the institutions that shape and govern life in the United States. And we can talk all night about who is right and who is wrong, about who gets it and who doesn't, about whose vision of America is true and whose vision of America is false. And the cable news channels will do exactly that every night, keeping the conversation going, but never moving it forward. But when trust is broken down, conversations about who is right and who is wrong, about who gets it and who doesn't, are fruitless because no one is listening to each other anymore and each side simply assumes that the other side is motivated not by a good faith pursuit of truth, but rather by an agenda or by prejudice or even by malice. So what do we do? How do we respond to a situation like this, to an overwhelming breakdown in trust in the very system we serve? In the New Testament book of James, the apostle writes, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, and let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. At the heart of this passage 
is the idea that it is not the trials we face that define us, but rather how we respond to those trials when they come. Because in our response, our character is revealed and we learn, perhaps for the first time, who we really are, what we truly believe, where we put our hope and trust. And as I see it, there are two possible responses to the current crisis. We can choose cynicism and despair, or we can choose hope. In cynicism and despair, we resign ourselves to the status quo, expect the worst, and look out for ourselves. We surround ourselves with people who see things the same way we do, and we turn our backs to those whose experiences and perspectives challenge or even threaten our own. Cynicism and despair are about preserving and surviving rather than growing and healing. They're about not letting things get worse rather than striving to make things better. They're about hunkering down rather than reaching out. So yes, we can choose cynicism and despair. And in fact, many of us do. But we can also choose hope. And hope, as you would expect, looks very different. In hope, we intentionally and regularly remind ourselves, daily if necessary, of the ideals and principles that inform the system we serve. And we commit ourselves over and over again to ensuring that those ideals and principles are realized and vindicated in every case that crosses our desk. We commit ourselves to ensuring that, to the extent it is within our power, the shadow of injustice, inequality, or corruption never taints the work we ourselves do. And we commit ourselves to ensuring that the laws set forth in the Constitution and passed by the legislature actually mean something. That the private contracts we enter into are worth the consideration that was exchanged. And that rights set forth on paper are not just empty promises incapable of enforcement or vindication by a neutral tribunal but instead are real, tangible things that are never out of reach and always ours to enjoy. It has been said that the law is a teacher, that through its mandates and prescriptions, society is schooled in what is right and what is wrong, what are the acceptable standards of human behavior, what are the rules defining and governing proper, proper human interaction. Our task, our responsibility, is to ensure that the law is a good teacher. And in moments such as this, when trust breaks down, to respond in such a way that the best angels of our nature are reflected not only in the law's words, but also in its enforcement and application. Every time, no exceptions. In his letter from Birmingham jail, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. teaches us that a just law is a man-made code that squares with the moral law or the law of God. An unjust law is a code that is out of harmony with the moral law. Any law that uplifts human personality is just. Any law that degrades human personality is unjust. I believe that in these words, we find the fuel for ensuring that we never lose hope in what we do, in the system we serve, or in the awesome potential each of us has to make a difference for good. In the very first chapter of Genesis, we are taught that God created humanity in his own image. And while this means many things, it at least means that each of us, from the most powerful to the most vulnerable, from the law-abiding to the law-breaking, bears, bears within us somewhere somehow the image of our Creator, that whatever else separates us, that truth, that identity, always unites us. And I think this idea is what informs Dr. King's vision of human personality and is what he asked the law to uplift and affirm rather than degrade or debase. Because imagine, if we as neighbors and citizens attorneys and judges, truly perceived one another in the terms that Dr. King invites, not with suspicion or indifference or alienation, 
but with unity and trust and affection because we are all of one source and despite our superficial and temporary differences, we are in fact perfectly united in a deep and profound and eternal way. I have no doubt that a society informed by this understanding of humanity would be a society defined by dignity and equality, a society in which degradation and despair simply had no place because in uplifting each other, we are uplifting the God who created us. In the opening paragraphs of that same letter, Dr. King writes that, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Never again can we afford to live with the narrow provincial outside agitator idea. Anyone who lives inside the United States can never be considered an outsider anywhere within its bounds. As we gather tonight, our nation is suffering a crisis of trust. As officers and agents of the law, our response must not be to give in to that sense of mistrust, to give in to cynicism and despair. Instead, our challenge, our responsibility, is to recognize that we are indeed caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. And to use the awesome privilege we have been given as attorneys and judges to ensure that whatever the perception of the law and legal system might be, it is always and only ever fair, equitable, and just in practice. And to the extent each of us plays a part in making that happen, I hope and expect that the justice we pursue and the justice we bring will be utterly unimpeachable. That is what hope and trust a man, and it is the very least we owe to one another. Thank you. You're watching the Illinois Channel, an independent nonprofit corporation form to provide gavel to gavel coverage of Illinois state government and other public affairs events taking place across Illinois.